<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations in Horror. I am your host, Kevin L. Powers, and we have a great show for you this week. Um, our special guest uh, is someone who is very fond of our show and been here plenty of times. His name is Thomas Tenorello. And tonight, we have a very special film for you uh, because it's one of my favorite films and it's one of his favorite films. And so we hope to be gushing over this film literally i guess uh <laughs> like blood that comes from uh someone's neck in this movie so there you go <laughs> we are going to be talking about lucio Fulce's zombie but first of all if you've never watched the show let us tell you a little bit about our special guest thomas take it away hi everybody my name is thomas tinarello i'm a screenwriter novelist uh part-time podcaster and uh I like cats, <laughs> not the musical. I mean, literally, I got two beautiful cats. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that since I was 19 years old. You know, loving cats and writing stuff. Um, usually horror stuff, actually. Uh, although occasionally I slip into sci-fi a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much me. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna venture off today because this is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I'm gonna tell everyone a little bit about me and the fact that I'm a huge zombie film lover. Uh, <laughs> this is actually the very first film that I ever watched that uh, Lucio Fulci ever did, and after that, I was hooked on all of his fucking movies. Uh, but so that everyone knows, I am a huge zombie film lover. Uh, and uh, George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead is still considered my all-time favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> I always watch, I literally watch that movie at least once a year. Uh, <laughs> so I, you could give the idea of just the type of films that I love. I, I like other films too, but I'm a huge zombie horror film lover. And I watch even the, the crappiest crap that comes out. And trust me, people, there's a lot of a lot of crap out there that gets released every year that has to deal with the horror and uh, zombie genre. But that's a little bit about me, and I'm sure we're going to get into it more uh, as we discuss this amazing film, or at least in my opinion, an amazing film. So, how old were you when you first saw this masterpiece, uh, Kevin? Oh, my God. I saw this on the accident. I must have been 14, 15 years old. That's when about I right. Yeah, yeah. I saw it about 14, 15 years old on accident. Um, I saw the version that actually called it Zombie 2. So I Ooh. I think it, I never saw the first zombie, but I was going to watch Zombie 2 anyways. <laughs> I did not know that this was that, you know, the original Dawn of the Dead by George Romero was called Zombie in Italy. And this is a, was a, a, you know, quote unquote a, a sequel to that one. I didn't know that watching it. The, ver the, the very first version of this movie I had or watched was from the library of all places. They rented it out to a 15-year-old. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so, so I saw rented it on VHS from the public <laughs> library. Nice. I did. I did, because they didn't check your age at a library. Surprisingly, uh, they they didn't seem to care what you rented. I rented a lot of horror movies from the library for the very first time uh, when I was really, really young. And so I watched this one, and among other things, now I got on my you know tirade of talking about uh, George Romero. I also saw his movie, Martin, for the first time by renting it from the library. Uh, <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. I was a, I was a huge fan watching this movie, and I thought it was you know the coolest thing ever. And you know I didn't realize it wasn't an actual sequel, and it has nothing to do with Dawn of the Dead at all. Well, in a sense, though, although it must have been a delight for you to find out, like, oh, I've, I have I have already seen Zombie. It was called Dawn of the Dead, yay! But to be fair, there's two things about this. Number one. This movie was not originally written as a sequel to Dawn of the Dead. Uh, according to IMDb, the the husband and wife screenwriting team who wrote this movie, what was their name? Uh, it's a <laughs> very hard to pronounce. Uh, <laughs> which is sad because I am Italian and I have a very hard to pronounce last name. But you do it very well, Kevin, and I'm very thankful for you for that. Uh, so and, anyway, but like it was... It, oh. Here we go. Husband and writer writing team by well, the name of you can edit this out. Uh Elisa Briganti and Dardano Saccionetti, who are husband and wife. 
and yeah. and what's and what's funny is uh, he they, they work together to write this bunch of other uh, knockoffs of better movies like uh, Bronx Warriors and Gladiators of the Year 2070, and of course the classic uh, Jaws knockoff Devil Fish, and the not a knockoff of anything Lumberto Brava's Demons or Demoni, <laughs> which I, but, I I own all of them. <laughs> that's awesome. On 4K, I'm sure, if they're available. Uh, but, uh, I, just Demons. Demons I do have uh, either. I, I can't remember if I got the I got I got the steel box of them, so I can't remember what they actually are. Uh, but the rest of them, I kind of, I'm a huge Italian film lover, so I have a huge collection of Italian giallo and Italian horror movies. Uh, you know. Man. But anyway, this movie was written before Dawn of the Dead came out in Italy. So the writers, so these two people, they had no idea about Dawn of the Dead even existing until after this movie was written. Uh, also, I think it's kind of cute that uh, in the end uh, uh, gets the final credit. So he and his wife wrote this movie together and he gave her credit. Mm -hmm. He never even took it. I think that's that's romantic. But uh, <laughs> But anyway, yeah. So, but truthfully... Even if you're going to take the position, oh, it's supposed to be a sequel to Zombie 2, a.k.a. Dawn of the Dead, which is what Dawn of the Dead's um, uh, Italian title was. Uh -huh. Even so, that version of Dawn of the Dead that the Italians got in the early 80s is not what you and I saw in the States. Because Dario Argento was a very good friend of the guy who made Suspiria, of course. Uh, he was very good friends with George Romero. And Romero was like, hey, uh, you know what? Um, we're going to distribute Dawn of the Dead in Italy here. Why don't you take it and cut it up, edit it to fit, you know, the more the sensibilities of Italian audiences? Because I guess Italian audiences won't understand the whole humor of like, you know, zombies getting pies in the face and stuff like that. So cut all that crap out and just put a lot of goblin music everywhere and just go nuts with it. So that's exactly what Dario Argento did. He cut the movie. Not in half, but he made it a slim, I think, 95 minutes or something like that. Yeah, so, so yeah, the so the so this version of Dawn of the Dead that they got was called Zombie with an I, uh, Dawn of the Dead. And it was much leaner, meaner, more action-y movie. And that's what this movie was supposed to be a sequel to, but only after the fact. <laughs> and how how late after the fact is production history legend we might get into later but it's it's a it's a long it's a thing <laughs> well considering that there are a lot of i guess not really consistent sequels to this zombie three four oh, yeah. uh, you know they're all kind of standalone films that just got labeled as a sequel yeah. to zombie because it was such a internationally financially uh viable name and successful yeah. so you know but but at least it's not as convoluted as uh, it's not as convoluted as the uh, demons franchise <laughs> oh yeah i forgot about that one too that one also has a lot of unofficial uh sequels <laughs> yeah all right so, i guess i'll go into if you don't mind like my origin story with this movie yes please <laughs> You were at the tender age of 14 when you saw this, but I, I think, was 40, maybe <laughs> maybe 39. No, I must have been 41. Yeah, I must have been 40, 41, because I saw this movie uh, at the tail end of COVID. Oh. Maybe, like, way through COVID, um, because it had just become available. Um, I think on most streaming services because up until then this movie was fairly hard to find uh, on you know it, I mean it wasn't streaming anywhere when streaming was you know nascent but uh, lately it's the, um, I think some of it had to do with the fact of like some of Fulci's movies had been recut and re-edited retitled in some cases uh, in the states and it wasn't until like the late 90s early 2000s when a lot of them were rediscovered and and restored to their original length um, and original titles, and people started rediscovering Fulci's work. I think the last uh, you know couple of decades have seen kind of a Fulci sense, if you will. Uh, so I think in COVID we were 
we have moved, we actually moved out of our house in Powder Springs. We had a nice two story house, but we had too many stairs. And I guess we just had some, uh, some COVID cabin fever and we decided to sell it. So we did, but we took way too long to find another house. So we ended up staying at my sister-in-law's house in a grungy part of town in a much smaller house with a five person family. It's just, it wasn't night. It wasn't good. So I think I watched this movie, uh, City of uh, City of the Living Dead, ah. and the and the, and the Beyond, one right after the other on on this cell phone right here. Oh my god! When I was sleeping on on uh, sister in law's couch late at night, feeling cold, so like huddled, you can picture me with my little cell phone huddled over watching Zombie for the first time <laughs> on oh. a little cell phone, and it was still amazing. <laughs> Wow, that's intriguing. Oh, I just saw City of the Living Dead again because I got it on uh, Blu-ray, and so I want to see it crystal clear. Because unfortunately, when I was growing up, Zombie and the rest, and City of the Living Dead and the Beyond, which I saw as Seven Doors of Death, I believe that's what the <laughs> I saw these things when I was younger, so I saw the alternate al- alternate versions of all these movies. Uh, we're all grainy, and so I've been slowly getting Blu-ray versions of them, so I actually watched them. So they're not grainy. <laughs> I want I want to see remastered versions of some of my favorite movies. Uh, and mm. I started with Fulce's movies, although unfortunately a lot of his films are just now being discovered, and some of them, you know, are not getting the high def uh, treatment. They're just getting either some a standard DVD copy, or I, or I'm or I've got like an Italian uh, region free version of a lot of his films. I still yeah. have not seen all of his films because some of them, like you said before, are very hard to find. So thankfully, Zombie is not one of those films that is hard to find. Yeah, people forget that like, Fulci did, he didn't just do horror movies. He did, I think this, I, I did I did the math. Fulci was like in his mid-40s and then he did Zombie. He had already made like 30 movies by the time he did this movie. So I think altogether, I looked on his IMDb, I think there's about 50-something movies credited to him. Yeah. And so he had a very long, varied career. And before he did this movie, he was known mostly for comedies and westerns. Yep. He did a lot but, of crime movies too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that makes sense that this was basically kind of a director for hire thing. Um, <laughs> it was. I mean, actually, it had a different, according to IMDb and the research I did, uh, and you probably know this already, but the. Hi, Gumpy. That was my cat, Gumpy. Whoa. You can cut this out. He wants to join us. So anyway, the uh, but yeah, there was another director on this movie when it was supposed to be more of an action movie. And this is probably before they saw Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> and Fulci comes in, and I imagine now I've seen like most of a documentary about Fulci's life, but I didn't get that far into it. I didn't get that far into the point where he made Zombie. But I oh. imagine. I imagine he saw the script to this movie. Maybe there had been footage shot already. And I imagine his thought process was something like this. You know, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm going to be making the best zombie movie ever made, but I'll tell you what I'm going to I'm going to make the most zombie movie ever made. <laughs> Uh, you know what? Now that I think about it, you're probably absolutely correct. That's probably exactly what he was thinking when he made this movie. <laughs> I'm going to put the most... He's going to make this the most zombie movie of all time. If you think about it, it is. Because uh, this movie has every single thing up until that point that makes a zombie. You know, even... Like, I mean, there's... You have... Of course, the Romero flesh-eating zombie part of it, which of course is de- which is derived from not even any legends about the undead, about the well, about zombies. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But but that more derives itself from uh, Richard Matheson's "I Am Legend," hmm. which which uh, Romero read and just said, "Hey, we should make a prequel to I Am Legend," but instead of you know. Blood sucking, they're flesh eating. Bam! Zombies got created. The modern zombie, at least. Yeah, yeah. I remember, he kept calling them ghouls before they got dubbed zombies. That's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he didn't call them zombies until Dawn of the Dead. 
but so. then so you have that aspect that have that kind of zombie and of course the i the the lore of shoot him in the head or destroy the brain they're dead mm-hmm. that cut so that's in this movie you also have like the mad scientist in this the frankenstein aspect yep. Then you also have the viral aspect to it, the plague aspect to it, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, a, in a little bit because I really think that's a huge part of this movie thematically is the idea of viruses and how they spread. But um, but the biggest part of this, of course, is what really wasn't a whole lot dealt with except outside of, say, a, a Val Luton movie, I Walk With a Zombie, is voodoo, voodoo culture and action ideas about what makes a zombie and truth be told i think that's the best part of it because as i tell people often my zombies are one of my favorite monsters because they're the only monster that actually exists uh (laughs) because in haiti they do make zombies i mean they're not literally the living dead but they might as well be uh so there's some of it just like the whole process of how it makes a zombie is so fascinating so fulci took all that stuff Mm-hmm. and said it we're gonna touch on all of it we're gonna put it all in there and I, while we're at it we're gonna make fun of jaws we're <laughs> gonna do all that stuff in one freaking movie <laughs> and it's gonna be under 90 minutes boom well once it starts it's so for people who have who may have not seen zombie uh you know once the action starts it never stops it's it, it, you know it you know you have a group of people who venture off to an island uh in search of someone and of course they get stuck in the middle of, of this uh plague slash voodoo zombie takeover of the island and they can't and the next thing they know they're they're just trying to get off the island as fast as possible unfortunately there are a ton of zombies rising from their graves and everyone who recently dies becomes a zombie and all they do is want to flesh eat it's not the deepest movie that's another thing you mentioned rising from the that is something that we we think of in you know folklore about you know people coming back rising from the grave to get revenge and like old ghost stories things like that that we think of as a zombie in some ways that was not in romero's version because remember romero's version it was always the unburied dead yeah there are no in no romero zombie movie you will ever see a zombie rising from the grave this movie not only gives you zombies rising from the grave um you know spoiler it gives you zombie resi from the grave POV camera. Yeah. <laughs> with dirt and dust flaking off the lens as it rises and you see the sky and the trees, which I don't think anybody else has ever done that. Like, uh. Well, I think that's one of the one of the most enduring qualities of the film, even though it lacks a you know a, a really deep story. It's the fact that it there are so many great individual ideals in this film, and so many great I like to say kills, but death scenes in this film that people hadn't seen before. Um, and it's it, it's something that even today, despite the fact that there are better makeup artists and stuff like that, it still holds up. Um, yeah. There's always a reason why this is Fulci's most talked about movie, other than the Beyond. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, and, and in fact, um, uh, this isn't in the in the IMD uh, thing, but uh, on uh, when uh, Joe Bob Briggs did this on uh, Last Drive-In, he talked about how the making of, and he probably heard this from uh, Fabio Fabrizi, the composer, because hmm. uh, he's a few guys who worked in this movie who's still alive. Uh, yeah. The, he probably he said that um, the ethos on this movie in terms of um, staging the action, the makeup especially, the way they treat the zombie, the way that they cinematically treat the zombies, so just the gore, the everything their ethos was constantly, we've got to do it better than the Mexican. Because they thought George Romero was Mexican. Oh, God. It didn't- they didn't know that he was Spanish from Pittsburgh. They thought he was Mexican. So they're like, we Italians, I gotta do it better than the Mexican. So if you look at it, actually, even though Romero's movies are more well-written and more well-acted um, and sometimes better edited and stuff, in many ways, they did they do do it better than the Mexican, quote-unquote. Because, I mean, sure, Savini's a legend, 
but Savini was still learning on the on Dawn of the Dead, and Savini wasn't even around for Night of the Living Dead. But the types of zombies that they have in Dawn, especially, I mean, they're all they all kind of look the same. They're all blue for no reason, and I mean, yeah, they all have different costumes, so they all have this kind of different personality to them. And Flyboy Zombie at the end. He's kind of the more more iconic zombie from that because of you know he, the the actor really puts himself into that part, but uh, and then of course there's like the cleaver head zombie, but by and large there's not a real like iconic look to them. But with this movie, they really just like went for the detail of creating a variety of different zombies mm-hmm. and made them all look rotted infected eaten up um mummified whatever i mean you have zombies from like the 1600s in this movie you have zombies who were zombies who were human beings 10 minutes ago so you have almost every form of decomposition in here short of skeleton that's so, a good and- point to say that's a good point to say because uh you're right Romero zombies and Dawn of the Dead do look very similar because Tom Savini went for a more thematic purpose. But in this movie, you get everything. Yeah, he emphasizes quality over quantity because actually, if you look at it very closely, and I counted, you never see more than 15 zombies on screen in this movie. Hmm. You actually go frame by frame. There's more than 15 of them on screen at any given moment. It seems like there's a lot of them towards the end, especially yeah, at the, okay. but nope, there's no more than 15 of them. <laughs> he was being economical. <laughs> he was being very economical. But yeah, so I think the, let's go. You give us a nice 5,000 mile view of the whole thing. Let's do, whoa, hey, let's take, let's, let's go in for a more closer look because there's so many things in this that deserve a fine tune. Um, all right let's start let's let's break it down let's break it down i will say like before we even get into the movie i want to say like uh i think before i even watched it on my phone uh in the midst of the in the midst of the pandemic <clears throat> i had i had known this movie by reputation like I, I remember like my first memory of knowing it existed was going through some magazine like a film magazine or a horror magazine or something and i saw i think the be being advert being sold on vhs or like early dvd or something and i saw that iconic poster to this movie mm-hmm. like if people people who don't know this is one of the most iconic posters to a zombie movie ever and when you see that poster with that brilliantly designed zombie face mm-hmm. on it you you instantly want to see that movie, and I did because I saw that poster with the uh, with a it, it's it's you know, go on go on go on IMDb people and just look at this poster because I cannot do it justice with my words. All I can tell you is even with this photograph, I could tell that this thing did not look like a man in makeup. It looked like a mummified corpse was staring right back into my soul with its cavitied out eyes. Which one of one of which is completely filled with real live worms mm-hmm. and smiling at you with crooked old teeth. And right above him is that brilliant catchphrase in English, which is, We are going to eat you. <laughs> and it is that poster that made me want to see this movie years ago. And then a few years later, um, I feel like that 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 one zombie who comes very late in the movie, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Only on screen for a grand total of two minutes, maybe, sadly. Uh, he's become kind of like the symbol of this movie in a weird way because of that poster. Yeah. And I'm going to put the question to you before we really get into it because I feel like this is a question worth asking is, do you think there's a more iconic zombie, like single zombie in movie history? I don't. Um, other than I mean, the closest you're gonna get is Tar Man from Returning the Living Dead, but Tar Man was never on a poster. Like this image is an iconic image uh for zombie culture. Um, if anyone, if any of our listeners out there uh read Eben Press's comic books, Zombie is the first comic book they released. 
and um, that zombie image uh, they recreated as a drawn a picture, and it's one of their uh, their iconic logos as well. Although you know, if you're following even press, they've now been they're sharing uh, stuff with a new company for distribution, but they used to put out. Bolche comic books on uh, an average of maybe two or three um, a year, specialty comic books. Some of the best comic books I've ever read. But Zombie, uh, they did an amazing work, a job on by interpreting it with new material and then doing a sequel to it as though Fulce was still alive and did his own sequel to his iconic movie. Um, that's how much of a culture this movie has gained over the years how much of a cult it has gained um evan oh, yeah. press evan press is completely built around Fulce's films and stories yeah. the beyond and oh, <laughs> i want to read those comics because i the, those look pretty amazing i mean i would say like going back to what we were talking about like this that that guy that creature's face just... i think it's got to be uh, to me it's going to be number one the most iconic single zombie in history partially because there's no mistaking what he is. He is not a skeleton. He's not some crazy guy in black and white or blue makeup. Full stop. Ask, is there anything that tops him? Well, I say no. Um, number two would probably be the little girl zombie from Night of Living Dead, just because she is on the poster for that movie originally. And then maybe three after her would be maybe Evil Ash from Army of Darkness. The tar Man you mentioned, I would fully agree. When, of course, we got to mention Trash. From Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think anybody remembers her face from that movie, if you know what I mean. And I think you do. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, and of course, we gotta, we gotta, we can't not talk about, you know, talking iconic zombies. We gotta talk about Bub from Day uh, of the Dead. Yep. His wrinkled face, I think, is part of what makes him uh, iconic and his little, his, his Walkman that he's wearing around his head. Yeah. And uh, uh, I gotta say, maybe the, uh, the Nazi zombies with goggles from Shockwaves. Oh yeah, you know what? They're uh, very memorable from their their poster as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Julie Walker definitely from Return of the Living Dead three. I would yeah for us zombie fans, she'd probably be a little bit higher on there, but yes, most definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'd throw in maybe like rounding out the bottom is like Evil Ed from Evil Dead two. You know, the one with like multiple teeth. <laughs> and of course, you know. Special one in my heart, the Michael Jackson zombie from Thriller. Probably the first zombie I may have ever seen. <laughs> you know what? As many people like to say that he's a zombie, I always picture that as one of those werewolf characters first before I do the zombie. I don't know why. Yeah, probably because that happens first. Yeah. I, I yeah. Everyone wants to say, oh, he's one of the greatest zombies uh, makeups ever. And I'm like, I always see it first as a werewolf, not so much a zombie. But... And I haven't seen Thriller in a God knows how long. I, I know it's bad to say, but I haven't seen that whole music video in, oh, shit, maybe two plus decades. So I'm going by memory on that one. Uh, dude, you missed, you missed out a chance for it on Halloween uh, last month, two months ago. But, oh, well, you know, for guys like us, it's Halloween all year round, you know? Pretty much, you know. Uh, I, I To be honest with you, I've seen his uh, – the because he's he's passed away uh his his version of his ghost 30 minute film before i've seen thriller again you know uh, what i've still seen that oh yeah it's on youtube i don't know where you could find it other than youtube i don't think they ever released it released it no they didn't yeah because yeah there's production difficulties yeah i've heard mick garris talk about it but i have never never actually seen it but it's yeah. cool it's cool it's 30 minutes long i think it's 30 minutes long the final version it's uh you know it's an amazing production uh you know but... so so speaking again going back to zombie and that poster and like i said i heard it by reputation yes you know, <laughs> in england it was put on the video nasties list for you people who uh, grew up in the states like we did don't know about the video nasties this really weird part uh in british culture history oh. where they try like the british board of film censors basically tried to you know have this little crusade where they rounded up anything that seemed excessively violent or vulgar or sexual at all and they like put them on this list that if a video store was caught carrying these things they could be raided and lose their license and all that stuff 
And Zombie was one of those movies. Yep. Yep. And it probably earns its reputation in a weird way. Oh, <laughs> one you well, one of the few p- films on the video nasties list that actually deserves to be on the list because you know there's a lot of films on there that don't deserve to be on the list <laughs> simply because of the title. <laughs> They're yeah, on the I, list or the cover. So a lot of them are probably the cover. Like, the cover looks salacious, and there was there really wasn't. Um, oh my god. <laughs> So the very beginning of this movie, I feel, is like a masterclass, and this is how you start a freaking movie. Mm. But it's, but it's so simple. It's just, it's almost like the, it's also very, very reminiscent of the Great Train Robbery, that silent movie where you know, just the cowboy shoots the audience. And mm. this one, you know, Doctor Reynard, we don't even know him yet. We just see a man in shadow with a gun, shoots at us. And then we see he's shooting a zombie in a, in a wrapped up in a sh- in a shroud. Blood explodes. He drops, and then he just says, "The boat, the boat can 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 now can tell the." <laughs> Cut to Fabio Fabrizi's amazing music, and I'm like, "That is how you start the freaking movie." Uh, you mentioned you mentioned him, and I need to get his book. Uh, yeah, there's a yeah. He has a book. Uh, I need to I need to get that book because he he was such an iconic composer of music of Italian films. Like he did so many of them. So I know, and he's still working. The uh, last thing he did most recently that uh, our audience might know of, he did the music for Puppet Master: The Littlest Reich, the latest Puppet Master movie. <laughs> That never ending. I have seen them all, so I know they're never ending. <laughs> so anyway, so the guy we saw, we find out later, was named Doctor Maynard, mm-hmm. and the boat he is referring to is basically. Uh, we find out later that it's it's owned by the zombie we just saw. We didn't realize this is the first zombie in this movie. That guy, that dead guy, he just shot. That's his boat, <laughs> and. It's uh, Tisha Farrow's character is his daughter, and mm-hmm. she's all like, I don't know what happened to my father. We have to find out what happened to him. This is his boat. So this boat, like, drifts into New York Harbor as a ghost ship, a la kind of like the Demeter in the Dracula novel, um, and comes in, and we see the cops, who are basically, who, by the way, were played by real cops, real New York cops, <laughs> and he gave them dialogue. Where they talk about, hey man, if we uh, salvage the ship, we could get a really big reward. Apparently, that's a real thing. If you salvage a ship in the state of New York, and there's nobody who claims it, you get like a lot of money. Apparently, Found so me. yeah. And so then we get the two cops go in there, and I, one of them goes below deck to see what's what what what's left of the crew. And what I think is cool is he goes down there, and then. He sees just rot. He sees the you know, food left around. He sees flies. He sees um, centipedes. I don't know how centipedes got on this this boat, but they're on a piano. And as we see them crawling on the piano, we hear this horrible wow, 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 wow on Fabio Fabrizi's score. And I think it's funny how, like, you know, Fabio turns up his music when you see creatures dancing on a piano keyboard. I think it's, that's a clever. That's a clever little pun visual joke. <laughs> like, like the bugs are playing music for you. <laughs> so, and then in we see, bam, first jump scare of this movie, a fat zombie. I don't know if I, I didn't realize this until I watched the movie again. But there's, not whole, there's not a lot of fat zombies in, <laughs> in zombie movie history. Aside from like this one in this movie and then Tor Johnson in uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Ah, uh, Tor Johnson. I mean, he's pretty much it. I mean, they even, like, ref- they even, like, create a homage to Tor Johnson in Thriller. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to put that on our list, too. <laughs> but keep I, 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 I have already seen that. I'm not sure I want to see it again. <laughs> I even seen the remake, which is not that much better. Oh Jesus! But it is interesting, <laughs> just because yeah, I'm a fan of some of the people who made it. Um, but anyway, yeah. So like a fat zombie, 
kills that one cop who turns out to be super important to the plot, weirdly enough. And that zo- that fat zombie comes up. That of course the cop who sees him says, Put "Hands up in the air." Now, apparently he doesn't know any of the rules about zombies, so he just shoots him in the chest twice, two or three times, and then the zo- the fat zombie falls into New York Harbor, and then the camera stays on it and pans up to see the city with the two towers, and you know what's going to happen. That's all we needed to see. Mm-hmm. But my only real caveat about this movie, well, the only big caveat I have, is that Fulci later on kind of spoils the ending by showing us much more than that. He shows us that cop who got bit, taken to a morgue, where he is examined by two very odd stereotypical coroners. One is a white guy and the other is this Afro black guy. And they just have this terrible like dialogue back and forth, not funny and just awkward. And they're like, give me the scalpel. And then we see the camera pan down and the zombie is about to get up and we assume eat these guys. But we cut back to our main action on the island and Fulci almost like, I guess he expects us to forget about that whole thing for the next hour of the movie. I don't know. I I thought they he would have been so much better if he just cut out the whole morgue section from the movie completely. Oh, that's an interesting take, yeah. Yeah, I think it would have been... If, if I ran this movie, I would have done that. Or if they released it nowadays, they definitely would have not telegraphed the ending too, too much. But anyway, like you said, yeah, they... So we got two our two leads, Tisha Farrow, who of course is the younger sister, older sister. I don't know how to uh, how much she's older or younger than Mia Farrow, former Miss uh, Woody Allen, and also the voice of one of the greatest an- an- um, yeah. movies of all time, The Last Unicorn, where she played the Last Unicorn. <laughs> oh right, that's right. Yes, yes. I watched that recently with my son. For the first time you know he watched it for the first time and he thought it was good but uh he didn't fall in love with it as much as i did when i was his age fortunately but yeah so tisa farrow didn't really have as as great a career as her sister did she kind of just did um low budget movies in there and like a, a couple of horror movies i think she retired from acting shortly after this movie oh yeah i think so too I, yeah her career wasn't very long yeah, because also I believe uh, that Fulci still like enjoy working working with her so much that he wanted her to play the lead in the Beyond, mm. but uh, but he ended up uh, casting Katarina McCall, and the rest is history. Yeah. So, yeah, but you know, some people have, have said probably because not necessarily because of this movie, but because of uh, the role she did earlier in Anthropophagus, the Grim Reaper. Um, she's gotten kind of a, a reputation as being a bad actress, but I don't think she's that bad. I don't um, either, and I didn't really care for that movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That's a... Ooh. Yeah, for those of y'all who don't know, Anthropophagus is known almost exclusively as being the movie where a cannibal tears open a pregnant lady's stomach and eats the baby. And I saw that once, and that was enough for me. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's rough for me to say because I've seen a lot of movies. I'm like, oh my god! That's what I think whenever like people say, "Oh, that movie was so gory, it was so disgusting," or they talk about like you know a slasher movie as being like really gory. I'm like, dude, I watch zombie movies. This is nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, like, uh, really? But anyway, so like they. Uh... <laughs> So on thank I have this really funny note. Like after talking about say on Thanksgiving, this movie came back into my head and I thought about what would happen. Uh okay. What? Yeah. It's just like a funny little it's like a weird thing that happened to me after I watched this movie again on Thanksgiving. I started thinking about what would happen to me if the zombies came to my house. On Thanksgiving? <laughs> no, like after Thanksgiving. Just like it started like invading. Like what would I do? What would be my plan of action? And I thought about like gathering up my family, going up into the attic, and how we would know if they were gone, and how we would get like, uh, like I ended up getting like really creeped out because like, 
you know, it's a terrifying idea. Well, of course it would. <laughs> in the movie Zombie, they're stuck on the island. In the real world, if there's freaking zombies everywhere, where the hell are you going to run? They're you can't run everywhere, exactly. But, like, there's the thing of, like, there before they get to the island, though, I want to talk about this hilarious moment. I This is the most funniest, weirdest, kind of neat, cute I've ever seen for two characters. Because Tisha Farrow um, is wanting to investigate the death of, or the disappearance of her dad. So she goes to the boat that's being guarded by this cop who is listening to disco in his car. <laughs> and I know this because it says in the, tit- the subtitles, disco music. <laughs> And she goes in. There's chalk outlined and bits of human you know, blood and viscera on the floor and stuff. She's searching there, doing her thing. And then all of a sudden, bam, Ian McCulloch, intrepid yeah. reporter Peter West, comes up saying, Shh, I've been here looking looking around, you know, investigating this too. Maybe we should compare notes, yada, yada, yada. So they decide to team up. But then, oh, the cop hears them and he's about to catch them. He's like, quick, just do what I say. We'll get out of this. And they pretend to be a couple making out in this boat. He's like, you know, it was your idea to come here. You wanted something romantic. And they go and do this this bit for this cop. And he buys it. (laughs) What I don't get is this cop is supposed to buy that these two people decide were, were just wandering around the New York Harbor at night looking for a place to bang. And they pick a crime scene with chalk outline and everything. Like, what? Both they didn't have to make sense. It was all about atmosphere, mood, <laughs> and the next kill. <laughs> I, 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 I propose that I think about it. I propose that he meant for that moment to be funny. But Fulci has a very strange sense of humor. Well, yeah, he he has a really strange sense of humor. Did you see his movie Cat in the Brain? Jeez. No, I have not. What, ah. what is that? <laughs> that's where... <laughs> oh, that's going to be a treat if you watch that. That's like bits and pieces of one of Fulte's unfinished films with him as... yeah, it, 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 He plays a character in his own movie. It's kind of whacked out, but it's a little crazy there. You just have to watch Cat in the Brain. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of this weird. I've seen the most, probably all of his horror movies. It is his earlier movies that are hard for me to find, and I have not seen all of them. I'm still on the lookout for some on my forever grocery store list of Foche films. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, they go into the so they go and they get a ticket to Haiti because yep. um, they find out that they're. I think it was Peter West who finds out that the boat was sailed out from Matul, some island in the, yeah, off of Haiti. So he's like, hey, let's go there. So the only scene in, in one of the only scenes actually in New York, they got to go to the LaGuardia airport. They go there. And I thought it was hilarious that they go to what I thought was Haiti, but is clearly the Dominican Republic because the cab driver speaks Spanish, not French. And the very offensive Caribbean music that is playing. <laughs> and and then I thought to myself, wow, there's a lot of sunshine and tropical island breezes in this horror movie I'm watching. There is, and I never noticed that until you mentioned it. You are absolutely correct. Like, this is this could definitely be put up there in the list, the hall of uh, what will be called, like, daylight horror. You know, movies that are yeah. horror movies that are almost entirely take place in broad daylight. Like, you know, Midsummer or And Now the Darkness and uh, a couple other examples I can't think of. I mean, I, well, I consider Jaws to be a horror movie, so we could put that up there on the list, too. Yeah. But it's just going to show you, you don't need to have, you know, Misty Fog and Dead of Night to be scary. Although there is some of that movie. <laughs> but, you know, you can have broad daylight and beautiful sandy beaches and something terrible can still happen to you there. <laughs> well, which kind of brings me to uh, my next uh, uh, discussion or something you wanted me to make sure to bring up because it's one of my favorite scenes, which is uh, the, the, the I guess, the reprieve when our uh, main actor decides she needs to go jump into oh. a lake. 
uh, and what she encounters in the in the ocean. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I want to say before we get into that, we got to talk about that because that's uh, the what I love about. I'm not a huge fan of gratuitous nudity, but I feel like the way they handled that nudity was great because I don't. So like they get on this boat, which is owned by two people, a couple who I will, the man I will simply call Redbeard because he has a beautiful red beard. I don't remember his name. His name's Brian, but I call him Redbeard. And so Redbeard's girlfriend, whom I don't remember her name. Her name is Aretta, but I'm not, I'm not going to remember that. So I'm going to call her Topless Skin Diver. So Topless Skin Diver gets topless and puts on scuba gear. She's saying, I'm going to get some shots because apparently she's a nature photographer. So, And while she's doing this, just like naturally stripping and putting on this gear and like it's like it's the most natural thing in the world in front of her boyfriend who is running the boat and David McCullough, sorry, Ian McCullough, Peter West, is just kind of bemused staring at her. But what sells it to me is that the scene is about the awkwardness of it and about the fact, and it's really about Tisa Farrow's eyebrow when she looks, she cocks her eye around, looks at Ian McCullough, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that sells it, that justifies it, and makes it comical and not, like, you know, leering. I mean, yes, it is male gazy, but still. You know, <laughs> as soon as we jump into the water with her, by the way, beautiful underwater photography in this movie. Yeah. I cannot wait to see this on 4K and see those coral reefs in 4K. It probably looks in incredible. So she's just swimming along and all of a sudden out comes this zombie who is played by the one Mexican in this movie. Uh, his name is Ramon Marquez or Ramon, Ramon something. Anyway, he was actually the trainer for the shark. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, because the guy, according to my research, so basically, the zombie tries to eat her. It's an underwater zombie, which we don't get very many of in movie history, an underwater zombie. He tries to eat her. She swims away by stabbing him in the face with some coral. And then, but she can't swim away because there's a shark in the area. And she's afraid the shark's going to eat her. So then movie history happens. The shark and the zombie fight. And there is no clear winner to this this battle and this battle is real it's a real shark there is no fake shark there is no stock footage used it's a real stunt guy who turns out to not be a stunt guy because apparently they had a stunt guy all ready to go and do this he chickened out oh wow i didn't know that he chickened out didn't want to do it so they got the actual shark trainer who is this mexican guy who trained the shark and apparently he he can hold his breath for a really, really long time. So most of the time, he probably just did not even need a respirator. He's just like... And so apparently, according to the lore, uh, or counsel on the set, they made him up like the zombie, and he fed the shark before the... He made sure the shark was, like, you know, really well fed and drugged up so that the shark wouldn't actually kill him. And yeah, he just he played with his pet shark basically in front of a camera. And at one point they put a prosthetic arm on him. The shark bites the arm off. And then the zombie bites the shark. I know. <laughs> with him, pulls him up to the surface and we never see them again. It's amazing. It's one of the most uh, remembered scenes of probably most horror films and zombie films in general. Uh, is if you mention iconic scenes for uh with zombies and people are always gonna mention the 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 zombie versus shark scene, it never fails. It's just one of those scenes that people just remember, whether they've seen the whole movie or not. I'm pretty sure you can find just that scene on YouTube that has probably been watched a billion times. It's like a King Kong versus Godzilla. Thing. I mean, it does it does further the plot a little bit because apparently the shark hits the boat and damages the drive shaft 
of the boat. I don't know anything about how boats are operated or mechanical engineering in general, but apparently you can still drive the boat when the drive shaft is damaged, but only for so long. But anyway, so the shark does do something before it gets eaten. Uh, but this, of course, but then, then this course leads us into that amazing sequence that you did not get away with today. I think that's part of the magic of this moment is that there'll never be another one like it. There's no, never going to be anyone who would be willing to, like, there was no, you guarantee, I'm guarantee you, there was no production insurance on this movie. Nobody, like, Fulci probably had a backup plan where, in case the shark ate him. But I am sure he was not ever going to compensate Ramon's family in case this, in case he died. There was no way there were animal rights people on standby to make sure the shark was not hurt. But since it was actually his trainer doing it, I'm pretty sure the shark was not hurt. But nowadays, they would just CGI the shark, or they would just CGI the zombie, or they would just do something around. It. But no, the fact that they did it for real, and you can tell they did it for real. I mean, the only and and it looks pretty seamless. I mean, there's only one little continuity error, but you can kind of tell that there's some bad editing where like the, the arm is off before the arm is pulled off. But mm. other than that, other than that, it's it's perfect. And Fabio Fabrizzi's main the zombie theme kicks in mm. and it just works perfectly with it. And yeah, there's never gonna be anything like that ever again. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a very expensive movie. I doubt they had insurance for that. <laughs> Kidding me? Oh my God! Now that you mentioned it like that, I was like, "Oh yeah, that's uh, yeah." He probably did use the original trainer for the shark. I wouldn't get in that damn uh, pool or in the open ocean with a shark that may or may not bite my arm off. Are you kidding me? I mean, even they told you, "Oh, it's okay. He's been fed. He's been he's been sedated." <laughs> I, I didn't see you do it. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those things that makes this film memorable. You, I, you have never seen anyone since then come up with something like a zombie versus shark. I, 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 I still don't think anyone's ever done anything like that. Um, I think the other thing you could probably do to top it is maybe zombie versus bear. <laughs> like a cocaine bear versus zombie. I think that's probably the next thing we're going to see. <laughs> It's cooking. I don't. Know. Uh, you no, know and you know what? I hate to say this, but the asylum probably has already done a movie like that. <laughs> I would not be surprised. I would not not at all be surprised. But anyway, so we go on from there to back to Matul, and we find out Doctor Maynard. We and what, here's one thing I do like about the way this movie is written is the way it deals with his character. Because it makes you think that Dr. Maynard is the villain of this movie. Mm -hmm. Because of his wife. Because of how his wife, um, played by Greek actress Olga Karikados, his name, I, I'm, I'm butchering. Poor, 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 poor girl. Uh, <laughs> for many reasons we'll get into later. Anyway, she seems to be like this put upon woman who's like an alcoholic and yeah. she's screaming at him for like, I know what you're doing. I know what you're really doing. You're messing with voodoo rights. And he slaps her. We instantly dislike him because he slaps her. And we think, oh, he is a crazy, uh, you know, mad doctor because that's what we've been conditioned to accept in Wait, horror movies. But that's later on we find out that is not the case. But that night, she's, you know, trying to, I guess, get off the stink of him. So she takes a shower. Uh, that is a gratuitous nudity sequence of the shower. She is very naked. But one of the, it also contains one of the few really good jump scares in this movie. When we get a POV through the window and then all of a sudden, bah, zombie fingers on the glass. Mm -hmm. That scared the crap out of me when I saw it. I was like, ooh, uh. And the whole sequence from then until she gets killed is shot and structured like a slasher movie. Because we learn two things. Well, first of all, I think it's funny how every time there's a POV shot of a zombie in this, we learn something about the zombie, which is in this world, in the world of zombie, 
Zombies breathe. They mm-hmm. respirate. You can hear them going. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. I didn't think about that till now. They do because so, it's so part of the soundtrack. Yeah. So, I mean, it's only there really because to let you know that it's a zombie PD and also because I think the trope of the heavy breathing slasher which just goes to let you know that this really is at this point kind of a slasher movie because they go in, they stalk her. I mean, we really see one zombie. We find out it's probably a couple, mm-hmm. but she sees it trying to come in. You don't see anything yet. You just see, you know, them trying to put up, put down the door. She tries to bolt the door with the cupboard. And then and all of a sudden, like it's, it's, it's a slatted door. It's a slatted door for a very specific reason. And then, bam, the hand comes out, grabs her by the hair, and very slowly pulls her head into a broken splinter of wood. And one goes right through her eyeball. Yes. Not quickly, but slowly. And this is what... Go ahead. I'm going to let you finish now. (laughs) I was going to say, the only thing I was going to say about the whole thing is, I mean... It's effective in everything it tries to do. It's shocking. It's revolting. It goes with Fulci's kind of whole aesthetic of assaulting the viewer's eyes with the imagery and, you know, the eyes being the window to the soul and piercing and all that stuff. I, all that's great. But what I don't like about it is the fact that she can see a freaking spike coming out of her eyeball and she never closes her eye? Really? <laughs> I close my eye when a freaking eyelash from I, I from you know from my 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 long eyelids get into my eye. I would definitely close my eyes when a freaking you know spike is coming at it. I mean, you still could have had like the you know the eye the closed eyelid get impaled and her eye like oozing out the side of it. That would have been cool too. But oh my god, that's the only complaint I have about that sequence. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, when Fulce was making this film, that he didn't think about stuff like logic does not play a key point in this movie at all. You should know that by now. It is all about mood, atmosphere, and just terrifying the audience. Well, uh, assaulting the audience is a better word. Not really terrifying. It's assaulting the audience uh, <laughs> with as much gore and useless violence that he can muster. He wants to make the ultimate zombie film better than that Mexican oh, zombie. Yes, you're right. You're right. I did say that, and I do think that is true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I still think, uh, especially if, he, if he'd shot that today, there would have been, I think making it a little more realistic would have made it more painful. Because, you know, the fact that it, her eyes are still open and it's clearly a prosthetic that gets pierced, it I mean, it's it's still great, but it, it takes away from the what would have been an extra load of viscerality. I mean, kind of like, and I'm sure Fulci was, you know, a student of this type of of this filmmaker. It does remind me a little bit of Unchin Andalao by, oh, yeah. uh, by what's his name, uh, Brunel, Louis Brunel. You know, the first eye trauma on film where they substitute a real woman's eye for a pig's eye and they literally do slice it open and you see the clear gel inside the inside the eye just kind of spill all over the place so like he could have done something like that but i will say like to me the the most horrifying i mean to me the eye gouging thing is not the most awful horrifying thing that gore that happens in this movie we'll come to that in a bit but to me, the most effective part of this that whole gag is is not when the eye gets pierced, but the fact that the camera lingers on this horror for a little, little bit longer, and like something like the appliance almost comes off, but the way it looks, like the the head shifts forward a little bit, and it looks like the eye is about to just come out of the socket. Oh. Yeah, if you watch it very closely, it looks like she's shifting and the appliance is about to, you know, and it looks like, oh, 
that that would have been the part if I'd seen this in the theater, I would have been like, okay, no, I can't, I can't. Ah! Like I would. That's one of those moments where like your imagination makes it worse than it actually is. It's a sh- it's a psycho shower scene effect. Except you get to see everything up to that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is a perfect example, though, of something that we'll probably talk to you more about when we go into the beyond, which is my favorite aspect of Fulci as a as a director. Is the, and the thing that I think, whether it's a gory movie or not, the thing that he, I think, is his signature um, visually is what I call Fulci's lingering camera. Mm. Because... Fulci's camera doesn't cut away when other when other directors cut away, whether it's something horrifying or whether it's beautiful. Um, he will he wants he, he he desires to put you in a space that is uncomfortable that you as a viewer do not want to be, mm-hmm. and you, and he also like puts the the lingering camera that just stays on the thing that you are disgusted repulsed and terrified of he just puts it right in your face and makes you live with it and that's i think what really defines his aesthetic overall is the lingering fulci (laughs) yeah but you know you're right he does that in a lot of his films he does that with a lot of uh key sequences of his films and the thing is uh it's what people remember people remember the 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 zombie shark sequence people remember the eyes gouging sequence for a reason um not because they're 100 percent authentic and realistic but because they're so iconic in how much it assaults your assaults the viewer like when you're talking about you know people in mo- in horror movies who are just assaulted and you're like oh this is a, I, I mean what's up what's some of your favorite kill scenes in the zombie film you're probably going to mention the zombie shark sequence and you're probably going to mention the eye gouging sequence uh, you yeah. remember it's anything like, else in this movie but those like, are- it's going to be right up there with um i would say like roads getting ripped to pieces in oh yeah uh, day of the dead mm-hmm but I, I think yeah. that's probably partially a part of the reason why that is up there on the list too is not the fact that of the 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 great special effects craft of how Rhodes gets ripped to pieces. It's the fact that he still has dialogue even after he's ripped apart. Oh, God. <laughs> we watch these movies too often. <laughs> so moving on from that glorious mon- mon- bleh, monstrosity, a tro- well, Okay, yes. With the, uh, affectionately termed atrocity that we just witnessed uh, like we go on for a while like forgetting she's just been murdered and I think we're fully expecting I was fully expecting to see her as a zombie never happens nope. um, like our two leads finally make it to the to the island after their drive shaft is damaged they shoot their flares up and uh, Dr. Maynard's just wandering around trying to he says he's trying to understand the phenomenon. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the main thing is he wants to understand it. But, but we still don't know exactly how complicit he is in this whole thing yet. But then, like, I think he he talks to his, uh, his nurse, his lab assistant, who at first I was fully convinced he's having an affair with her. I now realize, no, he's not screwing anybody in this movie. <laughs> but anyway... So like she tells him like there's more people who died, and they got you know they 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 body them up in those white shrouds and put them in a mass grave, which I think is one of the more iconic moments in this movie. I don't know why, but like hmm. especially in post COVID world, the fact that I know that at the beginning of the COVID epidemic there was mass graves in New York. I remember hearing that. I never saw it. They never took any pictures of it, but that stuck with me that there were mass graves in American soil. Um, so I guess that's probably why. I mean, also, I forgot to mention that, like, you know, of course, this movie was made in 1980, so guess what you see in the New York Harbor at least two or three times this movie? You see the two towers. And as somebody who had relatives who were in New York at the time, uh, even now, I still get a little ping whenever I see the two towers in a movie. So that's just a little side note that's a little serious. But anyway, so so Maynard is uh, doing his thing. He meets the people. He meets our heroes and mm-hmm. talk, basically info dumps them 
on what happened to Tisha Farrell's father and how he was like this brave guy who let let Maynard experiment on him basically for the point for the purpose of trying to find a cure for this disease that's what he calls it he calls it disease and I think that's again part of what makes this movie brilliant is that it is in a subtle and interesting way about viruses and about how they start yeah. they start usually in the third world they start in these little countries that are not prepared to handle the public health emergency that they are and guys like maynard are on the front lines of it and all they're trying to do is try to figure out where it comes from and how do we kill it and they can't and that's how it spreads and maybe that's how the movie that's how the world will really end <laughs> it, it'll start on some little island somewhere but talking about maynard i i don't uh, fulci doesn't see him as a villain because when they ask him point blank what the hell is going on here people are rising from the grave dead people are rising from the grave only to be killed a second time he basically tells them i don't know i have tried everything i have tried you know, virology, you know, science, you know, any, any kind of way to figure out how this is started, where it's coming from. Uh, he mentions voodoo, but and he, and he also mentions that, that it it brings people back from the dead. He's, but then later on, he says, I don't believe in voodoo. So that's kind of an inconsistency with this character um, that I would have changed a bit if, it were, if I were editing it. But <laughs> other than that, I think what's cool about his characterization is that he is not a villain. In fact, if you think about it, there are no villains in this movie. He talks about, um, and actually later on when he talks with uh, his 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 Haitian assistant, oh gosh, what was his name? Lucas. He talks to Lucas about what the heck could possibly be happening. And he mentions the Juju Man, that there's this witch doctor, which by the way, Juju Man's another word for witch doctor in voodoo. But the Juju Man has been running around screaming like a demon and... He's like he's possessed by a thousand devils, is what he says. And there's a suggestion that he is the cause of this plague. But yet, we never see the Juju Man. We never even go into that village very much. For all we know, the Juju Man doesn't really exist. He's just a rumor. So, Dr. Maynard, contrary to what you know, other, tr other horror movies like this and other tropes have, yeah, he doesn't. He is just as clueless about this phenomenon as everybody else is. There's no, there's no human face to the evil. Like, I mean, it's. I mean, I think I think Fulci decides to not show the Juju Man probably because, for two reasons. Number one, I don't. I think he he knows that if he does that, if he puts a human, if he puts a Haitian face on the evil that's terrifying the world. I think he's going to end up causing some unintentional racism to come through this movie. And I, uh -oh. think Fulci know, I think Fulci knows that. So he is going to go so far as to like, completely erase a villain from this movie so that he can be somewhat respectful of Haitian culture and uh, voodoo religion, even though there's very little actual voodoo in this movie. <laughs> but, uh, but I just think it's funny how most zombie movies are about human beings are the real monsters you know i mean literally a zombie is just a human deprived of a soul that's just you know romero's movies are definitely about that there's always a villain there's there's a colonel rhodes there's a mr cooper there's you know there's always somebody there's dennis hopper's character in land of the dead there's yeah. always somebody who is making life crappy for the human beings in the in the zombie world, but this is the one of the few zombie movies I can ever think of that have this kind of humanistic kind of, I would say, plagian um, view of humanity. There are no villains in this. Everybody is just people who are just trying to solve this problem and they can't. And in a weird way, I think that that's kind of, uh, I mean, I mean, obviously that comes from Fulci's kind of Marxist kind of humanistic you know, worldview. But in a way, yeah, but in a way, because he does that, I think, you know, people will go back to the ending again later. But, you know, people say, oh, this is one of the most bleakest endings in horror movie history. But really, I think this is probably one of the more hopeful 
uh, movie zombie movies because of Fulci's kind of exalted view of humanity. Because there's no villains in this. And therefore, I think that he's trying to say that in spite of all of this, you know, there's no like conspiracy behind it that caused it and is going to keep causing it. You know, everybody's just trying to do their own. Do, you know, and, and, and also, I just realized like nobody's really selfish in this movie. Everybody kind of helps everybody else out. Nobody backstabs anybody in this movie. Nobody like leaves anyone behind to just get eaten by zombies. None of that happens in this movie. So it's actually a very kind of hopeful kind of portrayal of humanity. And also, I mean, spoilers also like the epidemic itself is not worldwide. There's no suggestion that this is happening in the world. It's just an outbreak that goes into a super populist area. But, you know, with the humanity like this, they could probably they could probably get this under control in a few weeks. <laughs> Not unless you're like me and you saw this when you were too young and you di- didn't realize or you eventually realized that it's supposed to be a sequel to Dawn of the Dead, but in reality you start to think that it's more like a prequel. That's not <laughs> That's how I that's how I viewed it after I realized it was supposed to be a sequel behind that. I looked at it, it's how the zombie apocalypse started. That's oh. what I thought after I that is what I thought after I first saw this. I thought, you know, this really isn't a sequel to Dawn of the Dead. This could definitely be a prequel to Dawn of the Dead. But of course, you know, the zombies are completely different types of zombies. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And they and they rise from the grave, which leads us to this the other big iconic moment from this movie. Which is, uh, I had it written down how they got to this point, but somehow they run around. They get they they get in they get in the woods. Oh yeah, their car crashes. Now I remember. Car crashes. Yeah, I think they they leave the house where uh, Minard's wife is, I believe. Oh yes, we can't uh, we can't and... talk about that. They find her dead body, not zombified, mm. but being eaten. It's been hours she's been dead because she died at night. Now it is the day, yep. and there are. It's the first time they discover zombies, I think, aside from, you know, the shark thing. But, like, again, this is where Fulci is different from Romero in that he's decided to let's do it better than the Mexicans. So he has the zombies eating Olga Caracos, uh, his wife, like the most civilized kind of way that they're eating. They're just picking from her. It's like they're eating grapes. Just like mm, slowly, and like if there's no zombie feeding frenzies in this movie, they are they're not. It's not twenty eight days later. No, these are these are intelligent, sophisticated Italian zombies. <laughs> <laughs> so they. <laughs> wouldn't you agree? I mean, come on, where else do you see that? <laughs> I, you know, you bring up a good point. <laughs> Uh, I didn't think about it like that, quite like that. But you bring up a good point. You may you may actually bring up something new that I had never thought about before. <laughs> In fact, if you think about it, these zombies don't really eat very much uh, of the people, aside from that one moment. Because, like most of the time, um, all you see is they take a bite out of your neck or they take a bite out of your arm, and that's it. They're yep. sad for a while and they just walk off and bite somebody else and I, I thought that was interesting too because I was talking real quick I was talking to somebody online uh, on Facebook somebody brought up on a group I was in she's like you know in zombie movies why do they eat people because it seems counterintuitive because if you're gonna eat so if like it was zombies are eating somebody and there's they eat them to the bone there's nothing left they're not going to be making more zombies. Because <laughs> you think about it. Now, in Return of the Living Dead, they don't have that problem because all they want is to eat your brains. Yeah. And they and the rules in that movie is you can be a totally brainless zombie and still walk around and try to eat brains. I don't know how that makes sense, but okay, that's that. but that is the rules. So that at least can perpetuate a cycle. Whereas... In the Romero zombie world, it's 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 a wonder that they even spread the disease. But at least in that one, they have the conceit of you don't have to be bit. It's like you can die of natural causes 
in the Romero zombie world and still come back as a zombie because there's something cosmically wrong with the earth in that universe. In in this movie, yeah, in this movie, there's there is something cosmically wrong, but also <clears throat> but also these zombies seem to like know, hey, if we eat too much, we won't have any more zombies. So they just bite and go. <laughs> And the human who is barely eaten then can rise as a zombie. Oh my god. When you apply logic to these movies... It makes them so much better, doesn't it? (laughs) uh, At least much more comical, so the next time I watch this movie, I will at least have a different outlook on it than I've ever had before. Yes, (laughs) and I hope other people think of that too. But yeah, (laughs) so they run from these people and... I'm sorry, these zombie people... And uh, by the way, I love the fact that uh, Ian McCullum stabs one of the zombies in the head with a with an antelope skull. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These like, like I've never seen that before. That's pretty awesome. So they run, they get ch- they go into the jungle, they crash the car because of course, uh, well no, because they're they're avoiding another zombie in the road and they they hit him. So that's cool. At least that makes sense. And that's when they're running and come across a little grave in the middle of the jungle with tombs he's like and like saying like and mr and mr redbeard finds a, a very well preserved by the way conquistador's helmet in the ground like huh these must be from the 16th century meanwhile uh tisa Farrow and ian mccullough uh have just decided that they really are actually in love and start making out on the great ground and then bam a conquistador zombie hand reaches up from the ground and poor Cheese of Pharaoh's hair. And that yep. is when we get one of the most iconic zombie rising from the grave moments in history. And that's when we see the star of this movie, the zombie from the poster, which honestly, they need to make an action figure out of that zombie. I would buy it and I would put it up on my shelf next to next to Frankenstein. Because, although I, I'm sorry to say, though, you don't really see very much of him below the shoulder. No. So no. we that mom to like figure out what what else he looks like under there but whoever that actor is playing him i think he's like a six foot tall italian uh, football or soccer player sorry uh and he's just he rises up his worms spill out of his eyes and he smiles at topless skin diver and and i don't know about you kevin but i think that moment when he rips out her throat is even more just like awful than even the eye gouging scene because because a we care a little bit about Steve about Skin Diver Girl yeah. and also just like she te- they tear open her throat and you see the inside of the jugular and she's just like spurting spurting gushing blood and she is screaming a silent scream and it just goes on and on and on and then boom. Dead. I think you're right. I sorry. I was thinking a little. I was trying to figure out if they had actually made an action figure of the zombie from Zombie, and I think you're right. I don't think they ever have. They should. Dang it! I mean, Tar Man's an action figure. Why yeah, can't tar- that? I mean, all of the all of the iconic zombie figures from Romero's Dawn of the Dead have been made into action figures. It, it, I. I, I, there's a mask. There is a mask of the uh, of that zombie that you can get. Oh, a really high quality mask. It's actually really nice. I haven't gotten it yet. It's on my wish list because uh, I collect masks of iconic films like that. But uh, yeah, you're right. There is no action figure. Man, well, I think it's amazing. like um, I mean, we we can't we can't not talk about the significance of the fact that there's Spanish conquistador zombies that are coming out of the ground. Yes, uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> when I watch this scene now, it reminds me of the Tomb of the Blind Dead movies. But yes, <laughs> yes, I did not think about that until now. But you're absolutely right. Yes, I, I love those movies too. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, when I first saw this, I never, I, I just thought it was really cool. But now that I've seen all of the Tomb of the Blind Dead movies, and I watch those probably every two years or so. Um, I kind of now see that every time I, I, I watch Zombie, I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Because C- no one does 
those type of zombies. I think Tomb of the Blind Dead is one of the only films that did those type of zombies, and then they didn't they didn't like catch on. Um, so yeah. you know, both. yeah. I I mean, I personally feel like uh, when I see Spanish conquistador zombies come out of the ground in the context of where they are, I think, whoa, this is Fulci taking a stab at co- uh, colonialism. Mm. The yeah. idea the, the, the demons of colonial, you know, Spain are coming back to haunt us. You know, that's an interesting interpretation. I didn't think about that, but you could be absolutely right. You know, because this is supposed to take place in a third world country of which Menard has no idea why this is happening or how he can stop it. Uh, but maybe it's all happening because he is there. Right. And also I think I've just realized this is that Maynard can't figure out the, I mean, my gosh, it's like, it's so sad. You think about it. Like he can't f- even begin to find a cure for this because he can't even figure it out. Like, sci- like he is a stand in for science. He's Western medicine. Mm-hmm. Western medicine and science cannot, find an explanation for this because they lack the vocabulary to even deal with something like this because science by its very nature cannot deal with anything beyond the material world it simply cannot it cannot touch the question of the supernatural because it doesn't allow that at all in their their lexicon so that's why he's helpless to stop this force but also i think there's a sort of a gestalt uh, kind of thing going on here where the thing about voodoo is that and they mention this in the movie voodoo when they ask what is voodoo uh they say he says well voodoo is a mixture of catholicism and uh ancient african tribal rites all mixed together to create this third thing voodoo but the thing of it is is like voodoo is made for these two opposing things you know european Catholicism, and who, of course, who brought Catholicism to this part of the world? The Spanish. And, you know, well, of course, Fulci being a, you know, commie Marxist, he hates Catholicism. That's part of the reason why the burns at the end of this movie. But, <laughs> but also, I think, like, the idea of uh, a religion that be- that blends Christianity and tribal superstition and voodoo it's this kind of idea of like law and chaos. Because to Fulci, you know, Catholicism represents oppression and structure, but tribal superstition represents chaos. So it's like law and chaos come together in voodoo. And because Maynard it may have law, he, he can't understand chaos, he can't stop voodoo. Interesting. You are absolutely correct. I didn't think about that. See, this is why we have these conversations. Now, when I watch it again, I'm gonna have a whole new outlook on seeing certain <laughs> aspects of the movie. And although I need to probably do the same, well, <laughs> you know, some this is something that has never been mentioned that I can recall from any of the various movies, uh, books that I've read on Fulce's filmography, and I've read several. Uh, my 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 book collection is very extensive on uh, a lot of the my favorite horror directors. Uh, I think I have four or five that have been dedicated to Fulci himself. So wow. that is not something that's ever been mentioned in any of them. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know if he if he if Fulci was conscious of this, but honestly, the, with as much as Fulci's uh, work is all about the sort of conscious and. Um, you know, looking deep in the, you know, dream imagery and things like that. I, I think he'd be okay with us, uh, you know, reading reading stuff like that into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think he'd be f- totally fine with that. Um, God rest him. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, and also it makes me think of uh, one of the best reviews to this movie um, I read, and it's like right at the top of the IMDb list where on Metacritic, I can't remember who said it, but somebody said it best when they said that there's something primal, even biblical, about Fulci's zombie movies. There's like a tribal spirituality to it in a way. And yeah, I, and I think I agree with that, especially in the biblical sense. Because, you know, whether Fulci, whether atheist Fulci likes it or not, um, the, the 
very concept of zombies is a, a an apocalyptic in a religious sense of the word, and also a um, and a biblical concept, and also like even a pre a Near Eastern idea, this idea of hell and the being damned includes a cadaverous existence. Like I think some Mesopotamian um, ideas of the underworld show people wandering around rotting forever. That's what a zombie is. But also the Bible picks up that too, because when it talks about the second coming and it talks about the end of the world, it talks about there's two resurrections at the end of the world. There is the resurrection of the believers in Christ who rise to incorruptibility, meaning immortality, like Jesus did. But then there's everybody else who rises to corruption. And corruption meaning to rot. So again, you have that Near Eastern idea of the cadaverous, hellish existence. So basically that's saying there's going to be people who will be rising as walking corpses. They will rise to corruption. And uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, so I think that that's ingrained in us in a deep, deep way because it's been around with us for so long. Yeah. But the idea so, brings it to fact uh, the way you worded it is exactly how you can see uh, uh, the, the t- decay and the, cor- the corruption coming into New York Harbor and New York City at the very end of the film with that iconic image of the zombies walking on the Golden Golden, Golden Gate Bridge, I believe it is. Oh, no, no, no. That's the Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn story. Bridge. Sorry. <laughs> Brooklyn I, Bridge. Wait, wait a minute. Before I ask, my family is from New York. Where do you hail from originally? I don't hail from. I've never even been to New York. That's why I was like, I, I, I need you to correct me because I've never been to New York. Okay. I, I will correct you on that. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Before we get into that, I just want to touch base on the 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 most amazing sequence. Before that, is like they get together and they got a hole up in this church, which is oh. that, that that is where, of course, we get the action sequence. Like okay, that's. I think that is where you get okay. This 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 definitely was an action movie at one point because we got guns, we got lots of guns. Maynard <laughs> and our two characters and the whoever is surviving from his nurse's staff, they all just hold up in this church and fight the zombies and let them come in. They bottleneck them, which is a pretty okay strategy, except for the fact that you're throwing Molotov cocktails in a wooden structure. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to burn yourselves to death with these zombies, but okay. But it looks amazing. <laughs> They're throwing cocktails, and Tisa Farrow, God bless her, is actually doing something in this movie because after they find out about her dead family, has nothing to do. But she does help them kill zombies, and man, they kill a lot of them. Oh, and it just gets worse, you know, because the epidemic comes in, they come in through the back, they kill Maynard, they kill Lucas. They both become zombies and get shot in the head. And, uh, oh gosh, the music comes in and it's just amazing seeing zombies on fire and yeah, walking. But, but it's an amazing action sequence that you're not expecting in this movie. It's yeah. been a slow build up until this yeah. point. Yeah, because what you know is you got to end with a bang and he wants this to be the most zombie movie. I'm with them all in. This is also the first time we've seen them at night. So that's part of the, I mean, oh, by the way, again, he punctuates these 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 long shots of zombies walking in the woods at night with these extreme close-ups of a zombie. He picks, like, one really well-made-up zombie and just, like, puts him in the face. And what I find cool about the way that these zombies are is he made a conscious choice to make them up and cause them to... I mean, this is part of the whole debate of do you prefer fast zombies or slow zombies? I don't know about you, Kevin, but I personally prefer a slow zombie um, because, yeah, sure, they're not going to catch up to you, but it doesn't matter. They'll get you anyway because there's too many of them. Many of them. And, and cool. you, you see the slow zombies, but they're not just slow zombies. They are sleepwalking zombies. Their, their eyes are closed. And their heads bobbing to their side like this. There's a reason for that. You know what that reason is? No, tell me. I thought you would have figured that out. (laughs) No, it's because apparently Fulci did some research and found out that that's what real zombies look like. (laughs) 
he went to or he or he read books to people who had been to Haiti and said that when people who are under the spell of the zombie drug that the zombie that the, the voodoo wizards called the book cores put on people when they're up and about out, out from their grave where they dig them up rather their their eyes are closed usually they walk around listlessly and their heads usually hanging by their side so that's why these zombies look like that he wanted these zombies to look authentic <laughs> So very rarely in this movie do you see zombies with eyes open. Um, you see one zombie that's got a crooked eye. Her, her, her eyes are open. And there's only one other zombie that I can think of off the top of my head that has her eyes open. And it is poor topless skin diver. Because <laughs> she comes back. I think she's the only, actually, she's the only character who is like a main character in this movie who gets zombified and comes back which is part of the horror of zombie movies is your loved ones you saw die in horrible ways come back and they want to eat you you want to eat you yeah poor (laughs) poor poor you're talking about the in in sequence you gotta go out with a bang and it's a lot of action in there I know, yeah. It's like, it, yeah, the way that comes, like, Beard gets bit by his his love. They kill her. And he's like, kill me, kill me. They're on that boat. And what's funny, like, you keep mentioning that that sequence, although apparently the New York sequences were added after the fact. Oh, like, oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I mean, not that they were shot, not that they were, like, the movie was finished and they went back and shot them. It's that they weren't in the original script. Like, as soon as Dawn of the Dead came out and they were yeah. in production, like, oh, wait a minute. How's about this? Uh, we go put the, uh, see, we're gonna, we'll, we will float you. We will fly you to New York. And now uh, you will shoot to some parts of your movie in a New York. <laughs> the zombies in a New York, like a dawn of the dead. Like, okay, fine. As long as you're fitting the bill, okay. You know so, what? Yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. So that's what they did. And yeah, the poor, our poor lead characters are just like, hanging out on the boat for whatever... Oh, God, not for whatever reason. They tell you the reason that they won't kill Beard and put him out of his misery. Yeah, they want to they show. Know, they, yeah, Ian McCulloch's like, we gotta have somebody to show for it. We gotta prove this is happening. Yep. <laughs> of course, they turn on the radio and find out they don't need to keep Beard alive and prove it because... Everybody knows what's happening. Yeah, I know. That's one of the great things about that sequence is they hear that over the radio and it's like, ah, oh, shit. Yeah, and you see, and that's where we ended that iconic little sequence of zombies crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge, head, thank you. Head on into New York with the two towers looming and fatalistically, I think, in the background. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Fatalist, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's wow. It's, it's amazing how life is sometimes, huh? But anyway, it's like what's fun about that sequence is like apparently that was stolen footage. Oh, they I did. Yeah, it had to be stolen footage, dude. Hey. This culture, he probably had two dollars. Apparently, the way the way they did it, according to IMDb, is I don't know if you heard this, but they like Fulci got his zombie crew. And his two camera guys, which they didn't have to shoot sound because Italy never shoots sound. Uh, um, so really all we had was two camera guys, a bunch of zombies, and a van. And they got them all in a van and put them up on the Brooklyn Bridge. And apparently they had a production assistant as a lookout. Looked around. Okay, the coast is are clear. And they just they just rolled out, got their shots. Some people on the on the bridge honked at them, but other than that, nothing happened. Nobody called the cops. That... New York City zombie people on the Brooklyn Bridge. Nobody called the cops. Nobody said anything, well, and they were there in like less than an hour. <laughs> and keep in mind that back then, New York filmmakers used to steal shots all the time. You know, you hear the stories about the French Connection. Uh, if you've seen that movie, where they're driving through the, sea, the the streets of New York, 
They didn't have permits when they were, they were driving that shit. They're not all stunt cars in that sequence. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could not get away with that nowadays. <laughs> oh, hell no. You couldn't get away with that nowadays. But back then, dude, no what? Yeah. I can just yeah. imagine how old school movies used to film. They just stole shots all the time. And, it, you know. It I went. think probably because of the fact that he was Italian and it was an Italian company making it, I think he was pretty certain that the Americans are not going to sue me for this. Come on. They're going to care. Of course, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. But Fulci would come back to New York several times, uh, most most notably with uh, his last kind of big horror movie, which was the New York Ripper, mm-hmm. a movie that a, a movie that really does hate women, apparently. <laughs> I have not seen it. Oh, you yeah, haven't? No. Have you? Yeah, I told you I've seen all of his movies almost. I've seen I I've seen all of his horror movies. I can have them all. I have a, like a whole collection of Fulci movies, dude. Yeah. Woo. Dang. <laughs> yeah, New York Ripper. They oh. they rip stuff. They do oh. rip some stuff. <laughs> so let me just tell you this, and everyone else who's listening to this, uh, all about Fulci. Fulci's style of filmmaking is not exactly the most PC. It is heavily dated and uh, almost racist in some and sexist in some corners. Uh, but it was what the Italian market was was full of. You know, it wasn't something that you didn't see in the the, the late seventies and eighties. It was very common. Um, so therefore, you know, their cops are male chauvinist pigs a lot of the time, you know, <laughs> <laughs> these type of things are things you wouldn't see today. So when you watch a Fulci movie now, you have to, you have to step back into the decade in which he was making them, you know, you, the police were hardcore cops with no redeeming qualities and they were <laughs> male chauvinist pigs and, you know, th- these type of thing, attitudes uh, and the the slight racism of the seventy late seventies early eighties is just part of his movies. Um, I saw, luckily or unluckily, I guess I saw most of these in my early uh, or mid teen and late teen years. And then when I got into my nineties, in in the nineties, not my nineties, in the nineties, I started <laughs> to study and try and find as many of his films as possible. I've not seen them all, because like we've said, he made a lot of films in a lot of different genres, and there are a lot of his films that just have never been translated to the English language, and they're still just Italian, and there's no distributor who's looking for old Fulci movies. Like, his horror films are what he's known for. It's what has traveled internationally to lots of other countries. His earlier films, mm, are are more for us film geeks who just want to see what he did in his early career, but they don't have a, a bigger market. And now that you know streaming has taken over and physical DVD sales have dwindled, we probably won't see them anytime soon. Unless you I watch say, YouTube. Yeah, I mean I will see you're right. Everything you say is one hundred percent correct. Um I will say, like, God streaming in the in the sense for this movie because I probably would not have seen this movie if it were not for streaming. Because like I said, I first saw that picture in a magazine somewhere and thought, wow, that looks out there. (laughs) That looks obscure. But, you know, now with streaming, almost nothing is obscure nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, And even if it's not available in the States, you at least know it exists because it's on IMDb. You'll at least have a description of it in broken English. Of this, of this, you know, Japanese snuff movie from like the '80s that is just not gonna be available in the states probably ever. But you at least know it exists. But back then, you know, back in the '90s, like you had to really like, you know, fight tooth and nail to find these. It's it was it's almost like I guess like like people hunting for buried treasure or people trying to find drugs. You know, you you gotta to find the guy who knows a guy. I got a copy, you know, oh. freaking door duckling, you know, Fulci's first horror movie. You got to see it. It's new. It's new. <laughs> well, like I said, you know, I knew the beyond is seven doors of death. Uh, and we'll, we'll hopefully be able to discuss that one in a later episode. Um, and this one I knew is zombie too. I didn't know it was, you know, really just zombie for years. Uh, you know, you know, 
I, I saw a lot of this stuff when it was coming out, you know, uh, or probably the, the 80s were very prolific for me. I saw a lot of stuff in the 80s as a kid. Uh, oh. Not just the mainstream stuff. I just, I, I, my friends, my, uh, my, my, my brother's friend, uh, used to get him book, bootlegs of lots of movies that I would have never seen had I not had bootlegs. I would have never seen the Evil Dead 2 or Evil Dead had it not been <laughs> bootleg copies of it. Like, my video store didn't have Evil Dead 2 when it first came out. My, fr my <laughs> brother's friend had it on bootleg. I mean, I saw Akira. Uh, Akira, the, the animated movie classic, for the very first time on a bootleg. I didn't see like, it wasn't at a video store for me to just go rent Akira in the fucking 80s. I couldn't just go to any, I couldn't go like, now it's one of the most hailed anime films, uh, anime films ever. But in the 80s, anime films weren't really popular, you know? Or I guess they were. I'm, well, I saw it late eighties, early nineties. I guess is when I saw Akira, um, somewhere around there, uh, because I saw it when I was in middle school. Uh, so whatever the hell that was, a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I saw those movies when they were coming out. But my friend had it like the the end for bootlegs. He had bootlegs of everything, you know. Wow. <laughs> I had a bootleg friend when I was a kid. I had. Man, I, I you know I had the video store maybe, or I had like you know premium cable channels that my mom paid for, and I would record things off of HBO or Showtime or Cinemax or you know there was a, although there was a brief period in the late nineties early two thousands where there was a lot of pay cable channels. There were things like Flicks, which doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. Which I I'm not even sure what their whole thing was, but they had a lot of random obscure movies I would see on. Uh, you know, I can't even remember half the stuff, but every now and then I'd be like, oh, yeah, somebody will be post about some strange movie or something. Like, oh, yeah, I saw that on flicks years ago. Dang, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like, like to pl plug streaming services uh, that much, but I will say anyone who likes to watch these kind of obscure films can find a lot of them surprisingly on Tubi. Uh, but also uh, Shudder is where I started to find a lot of them during the pandemic. I God, when mm -hmm. the pandemic hit, I decided to purchase Shudder, and I realized that they had a lot of Italian movies and foreign films on there that I couldn't find anywhere else. Yeah. Um, God bless Shudder. That is where I saw uh, Zombie and The Beyond and City of the Living Dead was on Shudder. Probably also because, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Shudder is probably one of the only places of streaming that you will find this movie, Zombie, in its uncut format without commercials because oh. um because i don't have shutter right now because uh, money's a little tight hopefully lord willing next year money will get a little better and i'll be able to purchase it again uh but so when i rewatched this movie recently i had to look elsewhere uh the only place i could find it was on pluto tv with, with lots of commercials that were very annoying and I could swear that this is not the full <laughs> version. I could swear some things were missing, but I wasn't sure exactly what. But yeah, you gotta when you when you seek these things out, ladies and gentlemen who are listening, you gotta go on IMDb and mark mark well the runtime because oftentimes these movies have have different runtimes because they got cut and censored, and you don't want the censored version. You want the full. You want the full full cheat. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, you'll have to be uh Thomas, you're gonna have to get into the the, the Fulci uh uh house of craziness and start watching some of his more obscure films. Um, because there's a ton of them. And I I do, I, I do wanna see um uh Don't Torture a Duckling, which is one of his early, earlier movies that's not really it is horror, but it's not uh it's, it's a not, giallo. Yeah, it's more of a traditional giallo. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. but uh, I hear it's very, very interesting. I think that one's probably the one where he's most openly critical of the Catholic Church. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I hear it's very, very well done. And it's also like again, like I said, it's not like you know he's called the Godfather of Gore, but that's only because of these movies he made in the late eighties. Uh, you know, Don't Torture a Duckling is hardly any gore in it, so. He is, he's like, like we said before, 
Mr. Fulci was a much more uh, wider. Um, is the breadth of his talent was a lot more than just uh, these four or five movies that he made in the uh, late seventies and early eighties. <laughs> uh, I've seen most of his films now. Wow, crazy! Yeah, uh, yeah he directed. He he wrote a lot of films I have not seen. Um, I did not realize he did a version of White Fang. That's very disturbing. That's right. Yes, he did. And for a second, I thought I'd already seen that because I saw a version of White. I saw the White Fang with Charlton Heston in high school, and I thought, was that the one Fulci directed? And then I looked it up and was like, oh no, no, it's not. That's not that one. It's a different one. Uh, yeah, I that's probably when I looked up at one point and probably could not find because I don't know why they make these damn movies so hard to find. Uh, licensing, yeah, and the problem is they're foreign films and you know they may never have had an English subtitle uh track or they may never have dubbed it, but they dubbed every fucking Italian film back in the day because they didn't shoot live sound so. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of that is because, you know, well, there's some very interesting reasons for why they never shot live sound, aside from the fact that it was cheaper to do that. And in post-war Italy, they did not have, uh, they, they had mostly old silent movie cameras. So, of course, they didn't have the technology and they couldn't afford to upgrade it. But also, even if they wanted to upgrade it, the Mussolini government wouldn't let them. Hmm. because. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because if you had to post post record sound, that made it easier for the government to monitor what you were doing. You are correct. I completely forgot about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But this movie, Zombie, apparently was a huge hit in Italy. And that's probably why we're able to see it today, because it made a goat loads of Italian dollars. I don't know what the I think it's Lira or whatever is the, uh, the Italian dollar. Wow. Yep. So, uh, but yes, I would like to say that uh, Zombie has, uh, and this is one of our longer discussions because it is a film that we wanted to dive deep into and both of us absolutely enjoyed. Um, so much to talk about in it. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, yeah, there is. A... <laughs> you know what? We, pro we probably wouldn't talk about a Christopher Nolan film as much as we just talked about Zombie. <laughs> Because we're strange. We understand. <laughs> I hope you guys understand that at home. <laughs> we uh, hope you're strange like us. So any final words about the movie Zombie before we move on from this episode for this evening? Yes, I, I think I, I like to say that um, uh, if I were to, and I'll probably ask you this question too, if I were to rank this, I mean, we will rate this movie as well with our special picked objects from it um in a little bit but i but ever since i first saw it during the pandemic um i i, I started writing my my own zombie movie called no room in hell and uh, it's one of the it's probably one of the best scripts i've ever written and part of and it's got fulci through its dna through and through um i think we'll talk more about that when we talk about the beyond because the beyond is thoroughly influenced my script more okay. than anything. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, but zombie, <laughs> as I like to call it, um, I, 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 as a straight zombie movie, because <clears throat> I would not call the Beyond a straight zombie movie. It's got a lot no. more going on. Yeah. It's more of a haunted house movie. But I, I would definitely put this in the top three. Top three. Uh, zombie movies of all time, with number one for me being Evil Dead 2, number two being George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, the original, and Zombie would be number three for me. Everything else is struggling for number four. <laughs> well, interesting. Uh, I won't tell you my list, only I would tell you a story that I the, the, the story I did. So as a young teenager, and I hope my friends aren't watching this, the ones I subjected this to, uh, I did a triple feature with Zombie as the very first at-home screening I've ever done open to all my friends. I think we had 15 people there or so. 
uh, that yeah. surprisingly came to watch me showcase three fucking zombie films because I didn't think people were taking these movies seriously enough when I was in high school. <laughs> one of them was Zombie. One of them was Evil Dead 2. And the one that I absolutely loved, but no one else seemed to like at all, was Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. Oh, I want to see that. Bob Clark's zombie movie. Yeah. I love the movie, but no one else in the party liked that movie. They loved Zombie. That was a big hit. They absolutely loved Evil Dead 2. Thankfully, I ended the night with Evil Dead 2. Started it off with Zombie. Got everybody in the mood. Killed the mood when I played Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. And then everyone got all into the game when I played Evil Dead 2. So uh, <laughs> that's my story about Zombie. Uh, me trying to tell people about this film that I thought was amazing when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> I saw it when I was in middle school. And then and as a high schooler, I, I will always want to be a filmmaker. So the, what the first mm -hmm. thing I want to do is I'm going to do a triple feature screening. Uh, I believe it was actually either on Halloween or around Halloween when I did this. I think that's why I did the whole thing. Um, <laughs> but yes, I can tell you that Zombie was a huge hit because it had everyone's you know, gasping throughout the whole film. Uh, unfortunately, no one cared for children to play with dead, dead things because it's a very long, drawn-out drama that just happens to have a zombies at the end. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, Evil Dead 2. Everyone loves fucking Evil Dead 2. So, uh, mm -hmm. with that, I want to thank everyone uh, for listening to us rant about uh, <laughs> Lucio Foce's zombie. And I want to thank uh, Thomas for coming in and joining me on this. I don't get to rant like this as often as I would like to, but who else and uh, will care about me talking about one of my favorite subject matters, which is zombie movies. So <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining me for your conversations in horror. Please make sure to check us out on social media and check out some of our previous videos. You will find some of the more serious stuff with other films, or you can just find some of the films like this where we just rant and rave about the horror. Uh, everyone out there, Thank you so much, and have a good evening. So there's one question we have left for you and the audience, maybe at home after they watch this, which is, how many, how many, how many things will we rate this movie? The object I pick, a zombie shark. Because <laughs> even though they don't show it in this movie, I, I think that this shark in this movie got bit by that zombie and became a zombie shark and bit other sharks and made other zombie sharks. And that is a whole other movie. So I would, I would rate this movie. Um, let's say four and a half zombie sharks out of five. Okay. You give it four and a half. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and go higher than you. I'm going to give it five zombie sharks. Mostly because I grew up on this movie and I've seen it a whole shit ton of times. Uh, and it never gets boring to me. I, it, it, I still can watch it now and it never gets boring to me. Um, it's <laughs> one of the full chase film, only films that I have never gotten bored watching. So. Conversations in Horror is a Broken Lighthouse Pictures production produced by Kevin L. Powers, executive produced by Kelly A. Inoka, and originally filmed via Zoom technology. Conversations in Horror is hosted by Kevin L. Powers and co-hosted by various horror film lovers and filmmakers. To learn more about Mr. Powers, please make sure to check out his Patreon page and other social media platforms. Conversations in Horror is copyright 2024, Broken Lighthouse Pictures Productions.